For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rick Brimacombe, and on behalf of the Minneapolis Club and my firm, Brimacombe Capital, welcome to Club E. It's a new year and a new decade, and our panel today is Selling on Emotion. Um, not that you all would have to have the title of sales, whatever, but how many of you um, have a New Year's resolution to basically sell more of whatever you have than you did last year? Okay, I thought so. All right, so that's why we're all here to talk about selling on emotion and technically, um, or actually statistically, a lot of the New Year's resolutions start to fail in uh, February, so it's still January, so we're still av at it. Um, okay, but before we get to today's panel, first I'd like to thank our sponsors. Irish Titan is an e-commerce and strategic digital agency. Darren Lynch is off to my far right over there. Uh, Boulay CPAs and business advisors, advisors, Jay Trumbauer is here, right here in the middle. Um, and Jay and, and his uh, team at, at Boulay have helped with uh, some of the accounting and investment stuff I've been doing over the last handful of months. So thanks to Jay and your group for, for doing that. Uh, Highland Bank is a locally uh, owned and family owned community bank. I have in the far left, Joy, uh, Troy Rosenbrock and Angie Truckee. Uh, Barry, where are you? You're some, over there as well. Uh, thank you to Highland Bank. Winthrop and Weinstein is a general practice law firm. Minnesota Sales Institute, who works with company leadership and sales teams to increase revenue. Scott Plum is on my panel. So Scott's one of our uh, sponsors as well. And then the Network Connect is a catalytic gateway for connecting investors, companies, and service providers. Um, the folks who are my sponsors are companies that I've interacted with before and continue to interact with. So uh, to the extent uh, you can please uh, work with them. I know they've done a great job for me and my portfolio company. So again, really appreciate the support of our sponsors and can speak from firsthand experience to their ability to take care of uh, your business needs. As far as RSVPing, um, try to get it into brown paper ticket at least 24 hours in advance. Helps the club with their planning. Helps me with my inbox the day before. Uh, I don't get emails like, hey, do you got room for one more? The online reservations stop 24 hours in advance, so that's kind of the story there. You can go to the website clubby.com to sign up for the newsletter to hear about future events. Uh, we also have a LinkedIn group where you can learn about stuff there. It's Club E-Minneapolis, a uh, little under 3,000 folks uh, in that group. Um, and then um, last but not least, the Minneapolis Club. I know I got a couple of uh, representatives of the club off to my left over there, Lynn and Bridget. Um, the club has partnered with me um, on this group for 13 years, and um, they've been uh, wonderful partners uh, for me, and the club has been good for me both professionally and uh, personally, and so anybody who would like to learn about the club, you can reach out to Lynn, Bridget, or myself, or Andrea there standing up in the back. She can help as well. Hi, Andrea. <laughs> Andrea helps make these things happen, so without Andrea's help, they would definitely not happen. So why don't we all give Andrea a round of applause? And she has to put up with all my random emails and taking care of all the details, so thanks to her. All right, future events. Uh, Clubby Minneapolis, or, sorry, Clubby St. Paul, uh, January 15th, Rocket Fuel for Your Business, EOS 2.0. Um, let's see, Chum is right here up in front. You can um, talk to her if you'd like to learn more about that. January 16th in Maple Grove, Design, Protect, Fund, and Market, four keys for any new product. I'll be speaking at that one. That's January 16th. January 23rd, coming back here, is the Family Business Guide. February 6th, uh, coming back here, it's actually an interesting one. Larry Abdo spoke uh, about a year and a half ago or so, and Larry and Carol are gonna be doing a husband-wife uh, fireside chat with me talking about love, marriage, and work, life in a family business, and they've been married for almost 50 years and have done like 27 different businesses together. So it's a heck of a story, and if uh, you can work that into your schedule, that's February 6th back here. And then um, in March, uh, Lucas Harmon, my analyst, Lucas is uh, organizing a panel talking about igniting entrepreneurship early, starting and running businesses in your 20s and 30s. So that's what the future holds. Um, in terms of our panel today, I'm gonna just introduce everyone, then we'll circle back and let them tell you a little bit more about their backgrounds. 
Uh, first panelist is Paul Omont, who's owner and principal at Omont and Associates. And Paul and I have known each other from uh, back in the hood when we were like this tall. Our kids uh, were run as kids. His family and my family were running around together in Southwest Minneapolis, um, and. Uh, he comes from a large family and a couple of brothers, so we had a lot of interactions over the years. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Paul. Thank you very much for coming. Scott Plum is founder and president of the Minnesota Sales Institute, and Scott and I have interacted on a number of fronts on the business world, and he's helped me with stuff that, that I've been doing at both uh, my firm as well as my portfolio company. So thanks, Scott, for joining us. Kristen, uh, Krzyzewski is president of 11.2, and Kristen will probably tell us a little bit about the name because I asked her, so when I circle back to her, she can tell you about the name. And if you're a basketball fan, think of Mike Krzyzewski, and then you got her last name down, so that's, uh, that's her. And then last but not least, Terry Wu um, is a PhD and has his own firm uh, as a neuromarketing consultant and, and owner of Neuromarketing Services. Terry, um, like uh, other folks at the panel, I've had interactions with um, on a number of different occasions through the work world, and um, Terry has spoken uh, a couple of different times, uh, and so maybe you've seen him in St. Paul or at some of the other stuff I've done, a great addition to the panel, and Terry and the others really helped shape this conversation. So Scott and I started talking about what the, what the um, panel might look like and what the topics might be and um, obviously you all have responded to what we put together here because we have a great crowd and thank you all very much for being here. So let me go back and everybody just spend a little bit of time talking about your individual backgrounds and why don't we start with you Paul. So hello everyone I'm Paul Omad I've been in the public relations business for 30 years here in the Twin Cities. Most of my practice is on crisis and getting people out of trouble. The other half of my practice is getting people to where they want to go, whether that's through sales, marketing, advertising, whatever it may be. One of my specialties is helping people to learn how to sell better by using nonverbals and how they do that. We'll talk about that as we go today. Right. Scott. Thanks. My name is Scott Plum. Um, my company, Minnesota Sales Institute, I, I work with really two groups of, of companies or two groups of salespeople. One is a group that's just getting into sales. They want to have a good foundation. They want to be able to develop the, the techniques and the skills and get into good healthy habits as they have a career in sales. The other group are folks that have been selling for maybe 20 or 25, 30 years, and they just you know look at the marketplace and how the marketplace changes, and it just seems like the faucet has just turned off. And the marketplace is constantly changing, and if we don't change our sales conversations and change our relationships to have better sales conversations, then we kind of stall out and we feel like we're not in the right business anymore, or we feel like we need to cut our price to win the business, or we really lack the value proposition for how the marketplace has changed. So I work with a lot of companies on developing a value proposition and then working with their sales team on incorporating that value proposition into the marketplace. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Scott. Kristen, tell us a little bit about your firm, and in particular, the name, 11.2. Um, so 11, our, my corporation or my company partners with sales organizations to build training um, programs that help salespeople ascend and accelerate and break free from the, the burden of not knowing. 11.2 um, is the velocity an object has to travel to break free of the gravitational pull of the Earth. Uh, so the tie into that is I started my career at uh, NASA as a flight control engineer working in mission control in Houston and in Kaliningrad um, and was very fortunate to be part of a four member team that built the basis of the NASA operations in Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. That work um, was very exciting, but it also taught me the value and the power in breaking really complex topics into small pieces and then having the ability to navigate through that content very quickly to solve problems. So that's the basic premise of 11.2. Great, thank you. Terry. Hi, uh, my name is Terry Wu. Uh, I'm, owner, I'm, owner, I'm the owner of Neural Marketing Services. I like to imagine a scenario. You're gonna open the ice cream stand at a state fair. So you're gonna to need to decide how many flavors of ice cream you're gonna sell. Three flavors or 10 flavors. You're not so sure, so you ask your customers how many flavors you should sell. Naturally, they're gonna tell you they want more options. But if you're, selling, if you're selling 10 flavors, that's not a good idea because when people face too many choices, they cannot decide. You're much better off selling three flavors. This is the result of a research study. 
Neuromarketing is about understanding consumer buying decisions. It's based on psychology, neuroscience, and economics. At my company, Neuromarketing Services, we help businesses understand how and why customers buy their products and services. And also by applying your marketing principles, we can double, tri uh, triple, or quadruple their ROIs in their sales and marketing. So I spent the last 30 years in neuroscience. Also, the, over the last 16 years, I've been in marketing. Neuromarketing is the perfect marriage between mm -hmm. neuroscience and marketing. Great. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Paul, why don't we come back down here? Um, tell us a little bit more about this topic from your perspective. Well, first let me congratulate everybody in this room because this room was loud enough for me to know that everybody here speaks English. <laughs> but did you guys also know that you're bilingual? Each and every person in this room is bilingual because at the same time you're speaking English, you're speaking body language at the same time. So you're using cues to each other about how to engage with each other and you're not really thinking about it. So what we train people to do is how do you take that subconscious communication we all speak of body language and apply it consciously to get more of what you want by gender gendering different feelings among your target audience and yourself. Let me give you a quick example of how this works. Rick and I know each other for a long time. I know Margaret here, I haven't seen Margaret in how many years, Margaret, like 10 years maybe? Just, yeah, exactly. Goes Just, back oh, that was five years ago. Five Come years on, Margaret. <laughs> And I saw my friend David here as well. What happens, neuro lot, neuro, speaking of this body language, when you see someone you know, try this with a person sitting next to you, and you know them and you like them, your eyebrows come up just a little bit. Very subtly, you will go acknowledge them. As opposed to someone you don't know, your eyebrows will stay down. But by training yourself to bring your eyebrows up as if you've known that person your entire life the first time you meet them, they're more likely to, to like you off the bat, to feel good about you, and feel affirmed by you, just by that little thing. Now, no one's ever actually taught you that. Most of the things I'll talk about today, you'll go like, I already knew that, but it's about applying it. So think about it next time you see someone you know, about how that starts the interaction differently if you've never met them before. Act like you've known them your whole life. Because neurologically, I haven't seen Margaret in, okay, 15 years, right? But our eyebrows both came up because we know and like each other and have for years, as opposed to people I met for the first time, subconsciously, unless I made myself do it, we start from a position here as opposed to a position here. So you can shape your body language and how people feel about you just by consciously applying something that you do subconsciously. And that's just one of 20 different tells we all have that we can put in our arsenal to help us sell better. Great, thank you very much. Scott. Imagine you're going and looking for a new car after driving a vehicle for about 10 years and you don't buy the vehicle and then you get into your car after you've been driving it for 10 years and you realize all the things that you're missing that's all emotions that we're experiencing now we go through that to a certain point where we're able to justify our decision on buying a new vehicle or a different vehicle so we buy emotionally and we justify our decisions intellectually and in most cases we need about three reasons to make a decision. So if you look at all of the past decisions that you've ever made, do you usually have three reasons when it's more maybe of a want than a need? Of course, if you need a new furnace today, you're gonna make a decision rather quickly. However, a new car may be more of a want, so you go through the process emotionally and you justify it intellectually. So as you look at some of the decisions you've made, in the past, you're going to be able to see the interaction between emotions and rations. And if you ever made a mistake on anything and you reacted, it's probably the greater chance that any regret that you have is based on a reaction versus a response. So, so often when people get emotionally involved, they react versus consciously thinking about the decision and then responding. So it's really the balance between the two. Thanks, Rick. Great. Thank you. Kristen. So selling on emotion, how does training fit into this? Um, and from my perspective, it's, it's one of the three legs of a stool where you have the emotional component, you have the process, and then you have the training upon which you set your salespeople. Um, when you have all those three things in place, you allow them to really ascend. Um, I have seen an experience, and we believe that when you give salespeople structured training with fast consumable training, 
and they know where to find it, where to get it, and how to get through it, it really sets them up for success. Most sales organizations have informal training programs, um, long lectures, massive PowerPoint decks. They fly the whole sales organization in, bring them out of the field for a couple of days, and just have this massive training period. Um, unfortunately, data shows that that type of a, a situation results in about a 10% retention rate, which is a pretty poor ROI. Um, so what we're suggesting is that we replace that technique, which was actually developed in 1914, with a structured program that has fast consumable training to give salespeople that confidence of the product or service so they can truly focus on the customer and read those nonverbal cues. Great. Thank you. Terry. Um, I like to use Amazon as an example. You know, Amazon sells more than anybody else, but Amazon does not have a single salesperson. But how does Amazon sell? Amazon understands how to sell an emotion better than anybody else. Inside our brains, we have many unconscious biases. One of the biases is that we like to follow the crowd. When you go to Amazon to buy something, what's the most important factor in your decision? It's the reviews, it's the ratings, the number of questions answered, it's whether this is the best seller in the, in the category. We like to follow the crowd because the crowd makes us feel safer. We rely on other people to make our, make our decisions. Amazon understands that we, we, all the buying decisions are emotional decisions. So this is why Amazon uses other people's opinions to persuade us buy. So this is how Amazon sells, selling on emotion. Great. All right, one last time coming down here. But before we get to that, generally speaking, I have time for Q&A, and it's possible that we get there. But we worked really hard to cover a lot of stuff in this um, kind of agenda and outline I have. So why don't you bear with us and kind of roll with it, and then we'll see if we get some questions at the end. If we don't have time and you have specific questions, you can come to me or any of the panelists, and we'll make sure that you get your questions answered. Um, Paul, back down here, uh, you're a big believer, as you mentioned, in the power of understanding body language and the nonverbal cues that we all give off. I just raised my eyebrows at you. Um, <laughs> Not Jack Nicholson like, but you know. <laughs> hey, um, what are a couple of your favorite tips on how to read and um, understand and utilize body language? So one of the things we know about body language is it, com it comes in two flavors, right? There's instinctual body language that we're all born with. That means that there's certain things like if I start going like this, he's gonna react because he knows that's a fear thing. So Scott's gonna move away, that's instinctual. But there's also cultural body language. There's certain things you can do in Western culture that you can't do in other things. So understanding the value of your gestures and making sure it's culturally appropriate, whether it's for a small business, large business, in the US or not in the US, is, is really important. Last night I was watching a show on the History Channel, and it was a European setting, and they elected a new king, and everybody in the crowd was doing this. Okay? Well, in Europe, this has a totally different connotation to what it does for the United States. It means almost the exact opposite of people being excited. Go look it up. I'm not going to say it because it's a family show here, right? And, and we're being video. And we're being so videotaped. We want to keep it clean. But they were using the wrong body language culturally for for a, for a European audience. You could tell that they were North American actors doing the acting because they were so out of sync with the body language cueing. So we all learn body language. That's the cultural aspects and the stuff that we are born with. So the more that we can play to the instinctual body language when we work with people, the closer they are as a universal that they'll come towards us. So there's a reason we shake hands or bow in cultures when we greet each other, right? It shows that we are not a threat to them. So if I walked up to Scott with the back of my hand towards him, he's gonna react quite differently than if I walk up to him with the palm of my hand. This he'll take in affirmatively. Anywhere you go around the world, this work affirmatively. Anywhere across the world, if you come with the back of your hand to someone, they will first start off with, I don't trust that person, and they will subconsciously pull away from you. So if you program your body language to be more affirmative when you're interacting with people, you can get them to see your side more closely. I can take the fear equation out of his mindset and get him more in an affirmative motion so that I can sell him more, I can get to know him faster, I can speed up all the processes just because I've changed the pronation of my wrists, my eyebrows, my chest, whatever it may be, to make it look more affirmative to him. So it's a very simple trick, but again, you have to consciously apply it just like the eyebrow. Great, thank you. 
Scott, um, as it relates to emotions, what are the strongest emotions prospects have when they're buying? And then the flip side of that, uh, what's the strongest um, fear or the greatest fear folks have when they're making a purchase? Yeah. Uh, I think their primary uh, response is people love to buy. It's an emotional experience. They love to buy, but they hate to be sold. And their emotions are selfish. So self-interest is probably the main emotion that really drives their motivation you know it's what's in it for me their favorite radio station is WWIFM what's in it for me <laughs> and there, you know, it's human nature we're not going to be able to change that but we can change is how we interact with them so in interacting with prospects or customers <laughs> or other people if we change the perspective of the conversation we put a prospect in the context of being a customer or a client and we speak in that term it's going to put them in that position to be able to realize some of the the benefits that we offer and the gain that they're going to have when they end up working with us. Unfortunately, that does not have as much influence in a decision as cost, consequences, and risk. Lost aversion carries two and a half times more influence on making a decision than benefit. So it's a loss of control in the sales process. It's a loss of time, the greatest asset, or it's a loss in finances and other resources which ends up affecting their cost directly which is different than price so the cost consequences and risk of an action people doing nothing starts to have a greater influence in people making a decision so once they analyze the cost and consequences and risk and reducing all of those it makes it easier for them to see the benefits of receiving a response second but if you look at a lot of decisions that you've made, is it reduce cost, consequences, and risk first, and then receive the benefits? To follow up on Terry's point, when it comes to the reviews on Amazon, the reviews are sound logic, too, which is influential in the decision making. So when we look at self-interest, we can go, what are we going to receive, and what problem are we going to solve with a solution, and we find the option on Amazon, what's going to influence in the decision is the reviews, which are going to be the intellectual justification of sound logic that people have experienced in the past, which obviously carries a tremendous influence. You all know the influence of testimonials. You know the influence of LinkedIn recommendations. You know the influence of five-star Google reviews. So every customer you have, ask them, will you give me a five-star customer review on Google? If they don't say yes, figure out what needs to change in order to get that. And they may have to experience your service over time for them to feel like they're getting the value and the benefit of what you provided them in order for them to give you a five-star review. So stay in touch with them. Thanks for Great. Thank you. Kristen, you mentioned fast consumable training. What exactly is that? Uh, how can we use that to accelerate uh, lead conversion increases in sales? So I'll answer that question by starting with the end user, which is the salesperson. Um, we need to train salespeople differently. Salespeople think differently, they act differently, they need information very quickly. The customer's time or the prospect's time is absolutely at a premium, so they're, they're, they're under pressure all the time. A lot like it was at, in mission control where we're needing to solve these problems very quickly. So fast consumable training, I'll kind of break that down. This is what we propose. Fast means very easy to access, very structured, labeled, accessible with a mobile device. Consumable, um, the primary thing there is it needs to be in really small segments. The attention span of a salesperson is about seven seconds. Um, and we all love salespeople. I, um, but data shows that training for sales and for everyone should be no more than two to three minutes in segment, followed with a, a, ch a check for understanding. So I call this snackable sizes. <laughs> Additionally, to be consumable, you got to know where to find it. Um, so salespeople need a very definitive learning map or roadmap on what they're supposed to know and where they can find it. Um, and then the training part, training is not listening. As I said, listening, there's data that shows that you have about a 10% retention rate from listening to a lecture. Changing how you do training just a little bit can elevate that retention from 50 to 85%. Um, so what isn't fast consumable training, again, are those day-long, long lectures and massive PowerPoint decks. So give your salespeople that type of training. They will qualify leads faster, faster qualification is faster conversion, faster conversion, more sales. So fast consumable training, we really believe, is, is a major game changer for sales organizations. 
Great, thank you very much. Um, Terry, from a neuroscience perspective, uh, why do consumers buy on emotion? Um, this, the, the main reason is that all our decisions are shaped in one form or another by our emotions. I'd like to share with you one story, and this story demonstrates how strong of emo an impact the emotion can have on our decisions. When I say the name uh, Charles Whitman, does it ring a bell? On August 1st, 1966, Whitman woke up in the morning. He killed his mother and his wife. He took three power, high power rifles. He went to the University of Texas in Austin. He went up to the observation deck of the school's tower. He started shooting randomly. At the end, he killed a total of 16 people. He wounded another 31. And he was killed by the police. So autopsy results show that he had a nickel side brain tumor inside his brain. And that nickel-sized brain tumor pressed against the fear center inside his brain. That fear center is responsible for regulating the emotions, especially fear and aggression. The fear center is part of several structures that make up our emotional brain. All our emotions are rooted in this part of the emotional brain. So when the emotional brain malfunctions, we make very strange decisions or even horrible decisions like Whitman did. So over the last two to three decades, it has become clear that without emotion, we simply cannot make decisions. Medical studies have shown that when certain parts of the emotional brain got damaged, patients suffered both the lack of emotions and the inability to make decisions. Say you know somebody named Bob or Frank. You know, he had a stroke. The stroke damaged a large part of his emotional brain. So what's going to happen to him? What you will see was is, is he's, he's going to have a very hard time making decisions, even the simplest decisions. When he gets up early in the morning, he needs to pick up a shirt where to go to work. He's going to spend 20 or 30 minutes just debating whether he should wear the white shirt, blue shirt, or yellow shirt. When he goes to a grocery store to buy breakfast cereals, he's going to agonize over the, over the decision whether he should choose Wheaties, Cheerios, or cornflakes. So without our emotions, without the emotional brain being fully functional, we simply cannot make decisions, including buying decisions. Interesting. Didn't know the name for sure. Anyway, thank you. All right, so for the entire panel, doesn't matter kind of what order, whoever wants to jump in. Um, so let's start by kind of laying some, frown, uh, some framework around this discussion. How about clarifying the difference between selling and manipulation, and how do you distinguish between the two? Paul? <laughs> Start it Don't up. Don't look at me. <laughs> um, there, you can manipulate people, and that's very true. You can you can take someone that is that is not at your level and do it. So think of the old time model that you used to go buy cars at, and the guy would go back and talk to the sales manager to get the pricing and that whole thing, right? They were manipulating people on purpose, but yet how many people like that process? Anybody here that was like, oh, I loved it when they'd go back and talk about the price and come back, well, I can get you this, but I can't get you that. And it was all a big trade, as you find out later, right? And people did not like that, and they would tend not to go back to those dealers because the internet came out and kind of democratized the pricing of it, right? That's what it, we know that the price of a car is. So now they're selling based on not manipulation, but on value. And it's a completely mm -hmm. different concept. Mm -hmm. So what we've learned over time is that people don't like to be manipulated and eventually there'll be a negative backlash against you that'll help you keep you from selling the next time around. So we gotta be very careful that we don't cross that line. And I'd rather have someone you know, know me, like me, and buy from me, is usually what I tell my clients is, I want them to know me, I want them to like me before they buy from me. I want a relationship with them because a relational between two people is better than a transaction. And that's manipulation versus relationship. My mind. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'll, um, manipulation is taking advantage of somebody when there's no gain exchange from one side to the other. And in a situation of buying a car, when you're involved in a negotiations, sometimes it's a good idea to take a break. And it's even outside of buying a car. Now, is that manipulation? It may not be a manipulation because there's some value that is exchanged between the two people that are in the conversation. So as long as there's value being exchanged, I don't think that it's being manipulation. But if there's no value exchange and one person is taking advantage of another person's emotions, then it's totally manipulation. And in that case, 
you know, I, I think that it's just deceitful in doing that, but it has to be an exchange of value. From my perspective, there are two different ends of the spectrum. Uh, manipulation is pushing the product um, and manipulating the, the customer's need to fit your product. On the other end is truly listening, understanding what the customer needs, um, active listening, and having enough of product knowledge that you can understand whether or not your product or service would fit that unique need of the customer. Um, from your marketing perspective, selling is about persuasion. Persuasion is about helping customers make their decisions. And more importantly, is make it easy for customers to make their decisions. Manipulation is about deception, giving misinformation, and giving misleading information or hiding information. When you hear, you know, salespeople using high pressure tactic, you know, that's, that's manipulation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question again, whoever wants to tackle it first, uh, have at it. Um, from your perspective, what's the most important step in the sales process? Can I go first on that one? Yeah. I think the, the, I believe that the first step, the most important step is building trust and rapport with somebody to earn their respect. And, and I'm going to take Paul's point of being liked to a, another level, and that is to earn their respect. I'll give you a scenario. Imagine you're going to go to Hawaii this Saturday. Your flight leaves at 5 in the morning. You need somebody to pick you up at 3 a.m. Do you have friends that you like that you will not call? <laughs> Period. You, don't, you, you have them. You won't call them. You have maybe that second circle of friends going, you know, if I call them, I know they're going to be here because I respect them. I think every prospect wants to buy from a salesperson that they respect. So let's not stop at being liked. Let's strive to earning their respect. And once you earn their respect, then they're going to feel more comfortable working with you because they have to rely on you to make a change. If they like you but they don't rely on you, they won't make a change. So when you're working with somebody and you're getting them, prospects, emotionally involved, that's good because that's where we make decisions. Unfortunately, there are some salespeople that have the number one fear is being liked. They seek the approval of prospects. And when prospects get upset, then salespeople start to shut down. And when you get a prospect emotionally involved, they're on the verge of making a change, which is not easy for them. And when they respect the salesperson going through that change, they're gonna have greater confidence in the solution that's being provided. And most of us are selling solutions. And the confidence and credibility that the prospect has in the bearer of a promise, a salesperson, the greater the value. But if we don't earn that credibility and confidence in the beginning, we don't get the value. So it really starts with really striving to earn their respect. From my perspective, um, the most, part of the sale, most important part of the sales process relates to the active listening and the needs assessment. And it would just be our recommendation that all of your sales training in includes active listening and that you have components of your sales process training that talks about that initial training, refresher training annually, and the ability for new people or uh, very experienced people to go back and access that information or that training content to, to revitalize that skill. So if I can jump in and just share a story that isn't as you know cheery as Terry's story about the guy shooting people in the tower, right? <laughs> so, um, so a major hospital chain came to me a few years ago and they said, hey, will you help us market our surgery department? Because we're falling behind other <coughs> surgery departments and patients are booking away and our reimbursement rates are going lower because for certain government programs, you get your reimbursement based on customer satisfaction scores. So they thought they would fix this problem, this marketing problem or sales problem by glossier websites and stuff like that. And so I went over there, I watched the doctors, the surgeons interact with people, and I told them that wasn't their problem at all. Their problem was the rapport between the surgeon walking in after the surgery and the patient and not showing that kind of respect and human connection. And so we did an analysis of it, we watched the interactions going on, and now every surgeon that practices in that group for that hospital, they have to do three things. They have to walk in the room knowing the patient's name and not carrying a chart in front of them because if you've ever been in the hospital and you're laying down after surgery and the doctor walks in and goes, oh, hey, uh, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> the transplant of your 
kidney went well. <laughs> it doesn't inspire a relationship, and it doesn't show that you actually know Rick and what you did to him. You've just cracked him open, and you've put in new parts and whatever it is. And so they have to know that patient before they walk in the room so that they can walk in and kind of give them the eyebrow raise of saying, hey, Rick, good to see you again. How are you feeling? The second thing they have to do is get at eye level with that person so that they can be engaged in active listening with that patient. They can't be above the patient or below the patient. They have to be at eye level so that you're engaging with them and you can better respond to them and engage in active listening and have that respectful conversation. And the third thing they all have to do is that at some point they have to make physical contact. They have to come in and at least broach the trust barrier between two humans. Now in Western culture, I can get about arm's length from Scott before he starts becoming uncomfortable, right? He's gonna get more uncomfortable the closer <laughs> I get to him. It depends if you're raising your eyebrows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if we, show, if we show someone that we can come in and out of their space like a handshake in and out, they know, will say that they are, we are more trustworthy. So when you measure the interaction after, those that are able to make a contact and come in and out in a respectful way, they always get rated higher. They get rated as warmer, smarter, and better at their job. So we change the perception of that surgery department. Reimbursements, the, the patient satisfaction scores went up 38% in one year. The reimbursement rate increase on that was millions of dollars. And all we did is change three things of that interaction. Because the surgeon's really selling their service not only to that patient, but to the patient to give them a five-star recommendation to the next person coming through the, through the door. So it is about mutual respect, and it is about active listening with a patient, which doctors really do a horrible job at. Yeah, I think all we agree on is what we sell actually can make, how, how we sell can make people feel. Mm -hmm. Because our buying decisions are influenced by how we feel. I'd like to share with you a quick story. Well, a quick research study. About 20 years ago, a group of psychologists did a study at a wine store. They want to find out if the store's background music could influence shoppers' wine selections. So on certain days, they played pop music. And then on the other days, they played classical music. What they found out was the type of music did not influence the total number of bottles of wine sold. But on the days when they played cla classical music, people bought more expensive wines. So it makes perfect sense because when you hear classical music, you feel more relaxed, more romantic. I feel like I have more class, more taste. I'm going to spend more money. So how you feel can actually have a very strong influence on how you buy and how much you spend. Great. Thank you. Um, so if we want to sell an emotion, where and how do we start to get a better understanding about emotion? Kristen, your turn to start. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I would say is um, if we want to give the uh, salesperson on the front line the ability to focus on the customer and hear and see, we have to give them that base level of product and now, uh, product or service confidence. So we have to have that structured training, fast consumable training, where they're walking through the door with that level of confidence. But we also have to train them on being able to read and perceive and understand emotion. So again, um, sorry to be a broken record here, but this initial training with fast consumable training, reminders, and then the ability to go back and access um, the information they need uh, depending on what their questions are. So can I take a step at that one too? Absolutely. So one of the things I didn't give in my bio is that I also teach at the New University of St. Thomas. I teach both in the undergrad program and the grad program. And they allowed me to do some, some re research with a PhD there at, at the MBA school about how people buy services when they're under stress or, or when they have a conflict or a crisis. So if you have something that goes wrong in your business and it's never happened before and you've got to reach out to a crisis PR person or a lawyer, you usually will go to a referral, right? You'll make three phone calls and you'll decide who to buy. So we researched that dynamic of who people expected to find emotionally with them and how they would guide them through that process. And time and time again, there was only two people that they wanted to buy from. The first was what we called the butler that needed to show up. So again, you've never met this person before, they're coming to you under crisis, and your job is to sell them that you're the best person to handle that for them. And people told us, as we did the research, I want someone that's gonna take all my fears away from me and it's gonna help me from start to finish. I want them to explain everything that's going to happen, how it's going to go, what it's going to be like at the end, and take care of each and every one of my needs. They wanted a butler to show up so they were emotionally 
kind of taken care of. For people who had been through crisis before, they didn't want the butler anymore because they had kind of been through it, right? So the first time people wanted a butler. The second time people wanted the mercenary. They wanted the best person to come in and get the job done and then get, let them get back to work. And so when we help people sell crisis services or legal services, we are asking them, who do you want to appear as on that phone call and how do you do that, right? Because you're nonverbal on the phone. I mean, we, we're usually thinking about sales in person, but a lot of sales takes place on the phone or the initial interaction or subsequent could take place on the phone as well. And so you have to show up emotionally, intellectually, rationally that way in a persona that works for them. And you can, again, people here have kids, like kids with cell phones, right? Answer me this question. <clears throat> when you talk to your kids on the phone, can you hear them roll their eyes at you, mom and dad? <laughs> right? <clears throat> Absolutely you can. Because your body language and your tone of voice comes across the phone. So about a third of human interaction is tone of voice. So if our tone of voice isn't locked in, and our tone of voice is related to our body language, if we're not fully present with that person to lock them in, we can't be multitasking on a sales call like that because if we're typing something at the same time they're explaining the problem and we're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, yep, that's not being a butler or a mercenary. So we have to show up in a personality type, emotionally ourselves, that sells to them. So our research has kind of shown that they want two personality types when they buy that type of service. So then we go train people on how to show up as the mercenary or the butler to better sell them. I'll add that uh, people buy for their reasons, not yours. And unfortunately, most salespeople that start a conversation don't really uncover some of the motivations that the prospect has on making a change. So I think one of the most important questions that a salesperson can ever ask a prospect is, I'm kind of curious, why are you deciding to make a change now? So what happened an hour before or what happened a day before a prospect identified themselves? So we're going to buy for their reasons, not yours. The second thing that I really want to make clear is if you don't know what they're talking about, you don't know what you're talking about. And so often salespeople are so confident in their solutions and they're trained to be a problem solver, they leave the office, they go out into the marketplace and they're a problem solver talking about solutions all the time when in reality they should be a problem finder. And talking to people that want to make a change, asking questions for people to identify the cost, consequences, and risk of the main competition which everybody deals with, and that's in action, prospects doing nothing, and then presenting the applicable solution that sticks to the problem, and that's where value is defined. Salespeople that go out into the field talk about solutions all the time, and they're not talking to somebody that has a problem and there's no sale, what's the salesperson's natural reaction? Well, they're willing, not willing to pay enough, so let me cut the price. That's not true. There's not enough value, because you're talking to somebody that doesn't have a problem, or they haven't realized a future problem of not changing something today. How many of us are still paying for long distance? None of us are. There's a time where we had to make a decision not to pay for long distance anymore. And it was a rational decision, but it's also emotional because it's money out of our wallet. So we have to make a change, so then eventually people talk to a, a prospect that has a problem, then you present a solution. That's where value is defined. Thanks. Um, one thing I would start out with is um, I'm just trying to understand all the unconscious um, biases we have in our brains. As humans, we have close to 200 cognitive biases. And all these biases influence our decisions all the time without our awareness. And all these unconscious biases are rooted in emotions. One of the unconscious tendencies we have is we want to follow the crowd. You know, with the crowd following, by following the crowd, we feel safer. This is why we need to check out the reviews, the ratings. There's another unconscious bias called a scarcity bias. If something's scarce, we, mean, we think, yeah, that must be valuable, it must be good. And we had the loss aversion bias. Scott mentioned briefly about the loss aversion bias. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to lose anything, we don't want to risk anything. This is why people want freebies when they buy something. If you add something free, you can sell more. Well, the people want free stuff not because we're cheap, simply because we all have this unconscious loss aversion bias at work. So just start any saying all the unconscious biases. Hmm. Interesting, didn't know that, thank you. Um, 
so getting into kind of nuts and bolts of things, how about uh, sharing a few practical kind of techniques, specific actions that sales leaders uh, can build um, skills and knowledge around helping their folks uh, sell more on uh, emotion? I can start. Um, one of the things I want to bring to your attention is be mindful how you frame your statements. Because certain statements can trigger positive emotions, and certain statements can trigger negative emotions. I can give you an example. You ask a group of people, can you live on 80% of your income? Most people will say yes. Then ask another group of people, can you give up 20% of your income? Most people will say no. But 80%, living on 80% of income versus giving up 20% of income, they're identical. But they trigger different emotional responses. You go to a supermarket, you buy ground beef. The ground beef is labeled as 80% fat free. You buy it. But they change that label to 20% fat. <laughs> <laughs> then you're not going to buy it. But 80% fat free and 20% fat, they're identical but they trigger different emotional responses. So be mindful how you frame your statements. They can trigger different emotional responses. So um, I will add, what one thing sales leaders can do to equip their, their team to, to sell better on emotion. Um, I am really fortunate. Uh, my company has some really brilliant people involved in advising um, that are at the MIT Sloan School of Management. And they've recently reminded me of the significance and importance of asking people what they need to succeed. Often we do that at the beginning, and then we feel like we're done. Um, so we're doing that right now with salespeople, asking them what they need to, have to make training better. And every single person that has uh, answered this survey, which has been across the nation, has said, I don't really know where to find it. So the number one thing that we would suggest is centralize your training content. Uh, many of us use multiple tools. They're all over the place. People aren't really sure where to find it. Put things in one location. Make very clear expectations of what is required to reach a certain basic, basic level of knowledge and then to go to the next level or a learning map. And then, again, the third, uh, fast consumable training with a very definitive structure. One other kind of side note here is um, for those of you who have distributor or distributed sales networks, we should be providing them with this basic training for free. This is how we get Mindshare. We, we invite them, we give them a basic training on our product or service, and then we make that available to them um, in their location uh, to really sort of elevate that awareness and, and knowledge and mind share within the um, distributed sales network or dealer network. What I've learned in working with companies is that they, there is no sales process that is in place. And if you're managing the department, your VP of sales, manager, director, owner, if there's no process in place, you have a bunch of salespeople that have their own style. And they go, hey man, that's just the way I roll. <laughs> and it's tough to determine the outcome of conversations when you're dealing with multiple styles. Now style is important, but you can't manage what you don't measure. And when you're measuring a process, you're uncovering a system where you can identify efficiencies and inefficiencies to improve and find the kink in the hose and fix it. Uh, but in, in working with companies, I enforce and, and hold salespeople accountable to a process, but I never step on their style. And their style is their tone. Their style is their personality. The style is their ego. And every salesperson has got to have an ego when they go out into the marketplace because that's how they survive and take on rejection. If they don't have that ego and confidence, then they, they don't have that flair that they need to be able to take on adversity, which is really working with a person that wants to change but is not comfortable at the time. And they're constantly dealing with an action. And, and we all know that the cost of fixing a future problem is always greater than fixing a current problem. It's like you know, in, in inviting me to work with a sales team. If we don't fix it now, it's gonna be more expensive in the future because time is gonna go by, the problem's gonna increase, competition's gonna be greater, market share is gonna be reduced, and now it's gonna take more energy to try to have an impact on it. But really working with somebody to make a change now is a salesperson applying empathy to a prospect and protecting their dignity and saying, you're not alone. I see that a lot, it's very common. And, and here's some of the things that we do to, to work, work with companies like yours. I use the term work with intentionally. I do not like the word help. Because help is saying, I'm up here 
you're down here. Let me save you. Let me rescue you. Let me take over. What's the number one fear prospects have of dealing with a salesperson? A fear of losing control. And who we come in saying, oh, let me help you. Let me take over. Their guard goes up. And if we don't have the rapport established and we're not practicing the act of listening, the questions that we ask of prospects are not going to be returned with honest answers. They're going to be returned with answers that put prospects in the best light. Can you solve a problem if you don't have all the information? How can you prescribe a solution when you don't have a clear understanding about what the problem is? Thanks. So let me just give a quick retail example. Any retailers in here that run retail operations? Just one, maybe? Um, so I had a client that was a retailer, and they, they couldn't figure out why they weren't selling because people would walk into their store, and then they'd pull out their, their phone, and they'd buy it on Amazon <laughs> and give the product a five-star rating, right? And they were very frustrated with that. And I would watch, again, the sales clerk, male or woman, whatever the technique was, and I'd ask the owner, why do you have the, the lowest paid person and the most important pivotal thing of you getting revenue or not getting revenue? What have you done to train them to be a better salesperson at that point of sale? Because anybody can get anything in an hour with Amazon Prime. But what they can't sell is an experience. What they can't sell is a relationship between you and Amazon. But you can between two humans. And you can learn and you can teach people how to sell more in a retail setting, even with Amazon, because people will come back if they feel good about their salesperson. So we do some really simple sales training with them. And then we do this other little trick and just think about this. They wear a name tag now that has their name on it in big letters and two facts about them. My name is Bob. I'm originally from Canada. And I like to play hockey. We know, neurologically speaking, that if you know two data points personally about a person, you are more likely to like them and start your interaction with them and be able to visualize them as a friend or not based on that if you don't have that same information. So if you go on a cruise ship or you go to Disney and you notice people wearing those name badges that say two things about them, that's not just because they like to brag about being from Canada or playing hockey. It's because neurologically speaking, you are more likely to make a buy decision from them. So when we work with retailers, you'll see the stores that I work with here in the Twin Cities, the name tag's slightly bigger, not, not quite a clown button, but a bigger sign, right? And it'll tell you two things about that person and you are more likely to buy from them because you know them and you want to build a relationship with them. And that's a quick thing you can walk away with no matter what line of business you are in. So whether I'm helping a retailer that's selling $10 <coughs> products or my construction clients when you're selling a $10 million client project, we will actually go in and have do research on all the people that you're gonna go meet when you go pitch that business. And we'll find out two personal things about them. So when you walk in, you know which guy collects cats or whatever he or she does because you'll wanna go look for that name and that face <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that is, because you'll have that, your face will react differently to them. The same thing with the eyebrow arch, if you know two things about them. So don't make them a stranger. If you want to speed up your sales process, everybody is a friend to you and you're a friend to them. And it makes the sales process go that much easier. It takes away the fear just like that. All right, so we have a handful of minutes left. Let's uh, go to lightning round, kind of a quick answer. And let's, Paul, let's play off of that a little bit more. So talk a little bit about how training of frontline staff can help with the interaction with customers better, whether it's nonverbal cues or from an emotionally aware perspective. And let's hear from the whole panel, but we could start here or whomever would like to start with that one. Well, let me just, let me just start since I kind of left off. A lot of my sales work, so if you look at the, the last four or five big NFL stadiums that were sold in, in the United States, I was working with the people that won those bids to help them sell the project, right? So if you look at the Raider Stadium, we worked with the construction company, which is based here in the Twin Cities, to go win that project. And you're going to sell to their county board or the organization they set up to get the stadium funded and pay for it, and they're selecting between three construction companies to buy it. And they want to meet the people who are going to be doing the work. They could care less about the CEO, and so that often means that your site superintendent, who's a blue collar person, has to go interface with the county board chairman or the head of the organization, whatever. And how do you have that blue collar person warm up to that person non-verbally? Because you're gonna throw them into a room in Las Vegas, right? You get a time slot from 10 o'clock to noon to pitch your $500 million project or your $1.5 billion project. And it's in the hands of someone that is a construction superintendent because the client wants to meet that person. So how do you train that person to walk in and feel smooth and comfortable? 
Well, I can tell you what we do is that we'll run through that scenario with that person probably 10 to 15 times of have them walking in and out of a room to go meet that person, to get that first impression with them done exactly the right way. We train people on how to shake hands with people, how to make intimate contact with them. And when I mean intimate contact, it's coming into their bubble, in and out respectfully, to build that level of trust that you can only get through nonverbal communications. So we will cue the whole orchestration of that two hour meeting so that they have to sit upright the whole time, they can't slouch, there's no backs to the chairs when they speak. We will go through about 10 to 15 different things non-verbally that we know sell better. My construction clients tend to sell about 35% more of their projects using this system than doing it the way they did it before. When the average project is somewhere between 20 and $30 million, that's a big thing that you've just done through non-verbal selling. So you have to train top to bottom it can't be a CEO who's just really smooth. It's gotta be the retail clerk and it's gotta be the construction worker who's blue collar, who's not comfortable among, among the suits to make he or she feel really comfortable. And that's how you sell them. Okay. Great. Anybody else want to try that? I, I, I would one? consider it a lot like walking through TSA at the airport. You know, show them your hands, smile, and listen. <laughs> Very similar. Exactly. Uh, you know, salespeople that are wearing sunglasses, that's a big turnoff for prospects. If prospects can't see your eyes, there's a level of high distrust. And I would add just quickly, think Orange Theory. I love going there, why everybody's been trained. The front guy, the guy's wiping the floor, he knows the product, he's smiling, he's saying goodbye, Kristen. You know, everybody in the organization, they walk in day one, this is what you need to know. This is our product. This is our company. This, these are our values. These are how you look at people. Um, tell every single solitary person in the organization what they need to know and then give them a way to learn it. I'll add something quickly. Um, you know, say you're going to a um, store that sells shirts. You know, I would say, you know, the frontline person probably the opening question should be, you know, would you like to sell, would you like to see our best sellers? The bottom line is when you try to persuade, use numbers. People want to know, you know, how many shirts you have sold, how many you have left in the stock, you know, how many, you know, which are the best sellers, what kind of ratings people have. So when we, from a seller perspective, when we try to persuade, we try to sell, there's power in numbers. From the buyer's perspective, when you try to buy something, there is safety in numbers. So use numbers to do the persuasion. Okay, great. All right, so one tip, only one. Uh, as it relates to selling on emotion that kind of smaller uh, companies that are growing but maybe not as well financed or as big or have the same budget as other folks. So kind of the up and comers because we have a lot of those folks in the audience here as well as the people who will be watching the video and so forth. But so if you're a little smaller competitor without quite as much budget, what's one tip to compete on this uh, selling on emotion landscape? I'll start with that one. Training doesn't have to cost a lot or take a lot of time to build. Most organizations have what they need. It, they just need to assemble it and put it in a logical way and make it very structured. The smaller company with the, the sales guys doing a, a, many times the inside sales, the tech support, they're doing more things. It's more important that those guys are really well trained and have access to the information that they need in the field. Um, not saying it's not important for large companies, but um, training programs can be quick and inexpensive to build. I can add that to that. Um, you know, a lot of small companies, they don't have the big numbers. They don't have a lot of customers. But one really over, overlooked technique is to use photos along with testimonials. As a small company, you know, as long as you have a, a few testimonials, testimonials, you can make a very powerful persuasion. And here's why. We like to know how many people have bought your products and services. But also like to know who bought the products and services. We like to see faces. The brain is designed to see faces because there's a large area of the brain that's its only job to recognize faces. So by showing faces, you can trigger very positive emotions in your, in your customers. So use photos, happy customers' photos, along with your testimonials to make a powerful persuasion. Can I add, there, there's a trend going on sales automation right now and it's starting to gain some momentum. And I think the most, uh, treasured asset of a company is a sales team, is a salesperson. And prospects love to talk to salespeople when it comes to buying and also when it comes to servicing. 
And if we're creating a lot of technology to stop that conversation going on, we're really selling more on price than value. And there's going to always be somebody that's willing to pay a better price, a higher price for better value. So making sure that we have those conversations is going to make it easier for us to maintain a fighting force with companies that are well financed and focus so much on technology that they take away the relationship and the conversation between the prospect and the customer <coughs> and the and salesperson. Rick, what I would say is uh, if anybody's been to Disney, right, you go to Disney and it, they're selling you an experience and it's a magical experience, but if you go on the behind the scenes tour, right, all the characters, whether you are, you know, Snow White that comes out and waves to the kids or the person selling ice cream, right, they go into the changing room, they change into their costumes, right, and then there's a wide yellow line. Before you clock out to go outside, you have to cross over the yellow line. And if you're not completely 100% ready to cross the yellow line, there's a coach there that gets you ready to go deliver customer winning service each and every time. So I'll tell companies as you grow and all of a sudden you're taking on different things, if you're not ready to cross the yellow line, right, to go give that next client or that next prospect award winning service, don't cross the yellow line. Step back, take a few minutes, reset yourself, think about your strategy, think about how you're coming across and how emotions might be driving it, and reset. So as companies grow, they tend to get very discombobulated. So if you're in the sales portion of doing that, cross the yellow line, make sure you're 110% ready to go. Okay. All right, last question, summarize it for everybody here, and then uh, folks can get back to their offices. Just kind of a wrap-up um, summary of our topic, any parting thoughts, little quick uh, Brief little summary. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I would tell you as, as I've learned this, um, my background actually, I started back in the airline business 30 years ago, kind of like being in mission control. We watched pilots that would have to interact with each other in a cockpit. So you would be able to see and we'd watch the simulator tapes of people that would crash the simulator. And we could tell it every time based on how they were interacting non-verbally, right? You could see two people who didn't get along or weren't communicating well. So learning all these cues that we give off and mastering the cues and giving just a little bit of thought. I also tell people when I do nonverbal training for clients, you know 100% of what I'm telling you. You're just not consciously applying it. So walk away. Watch some of the videos on YouTube. It's really funny the way things people can learn these things. See how the nonverbals are affecting your ability to sell or move things forward based on the cues that you're giving off because you do affect people based on the way you move your body and how you interact. On the uh, tables, there's a flyer on a class that I'm doing in February, so if you want to take a picture of that, you can learn more about what I do there. Parting message would be the most important step in the sales process is the application. Really applying what you know, like Paul said. We all have the answers in, inside of us. It's just a matter of the application of it. And here's the motivation I think all of us need to strive for and also teach and share with other people, is that there's no reason for us to change if we don't believe that we deserve a better life. If we don't believe that we deserve better results, there's no reason for us to apply anything new. So if you leave here today with the belief that you deserve a better life and you deserve better results, then work on the application of what you already know. If you don't know it, find the answers and then apply it. But all the success that you're gonna have when you leave this room is everything up to you and what you apply. And the opportunities that you miss are most likely because of a lack of involvement and a lack of participation and a lack of application. So thanks for being here today. So many times when sales organizations aren't meeting plan, they're looking at hiring more people, thinking they need more people on their, their uh, sales team. So what we suggest is that the people, investing in the people you have, giving them the tools that they need to reach their max performance, 11.2, <coughs> breaking free of the constraint of not knowing or not having access to the right information. Uh, build a base of knowledge with your sales team, but then give them access to all that stuff they can't remember when they're out in the field with fast consumable training. Um, uh, to be honest with you, when this approach was first applied to a public company, um, I wasn't 100% sure how it was going to work, but within 18 months we saw 34,000 hours of on-demand training pulled from this system. Uh, so fast <coughs> consumable training, we've seen it can really be a game changer for your um, for your team, doesn't have to cost a lot, doesn't have to take a lot of time to build. I want to raise a question for you to think about it. And this question normally is for philosophers and neuroscientists. But I think everybody in sales and marketing should really think about this question. Well, if we do, if we make 95% of our decisions unconsciously, do we have free will? <laughs> think, think about last time you bought something at Amazon. 
did you make that decision yourself? Or did Amazon make, did Amazon make that decision before you even went to Amazon? <laughs> we like to think we have free will, but we don't like making decisions. We like to follow the crowd to make decisions, including buying decisions. In sales, if you can help your customers make decisions and make it easy for them to make decisions, you're gonna sell more. Amazon doesn't sell you anything. Amazon helps you buy everything. But that's my conclusion. Great, thank you. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you very much. Again, we can hang out as long as you'd like. Feel free to reach out to them or myself and hope to see you soon. Happy 2020. <laughs>